I have a title for today's message, and it's a title ripped from the pages of Scripture, and it goes like this. None is righteous, no, not one. None is righteous, no, not one. Jesus' three and a half years of ministry took place at a time of widespread civil unrest. I don't know if you've ever really thought about it. But when you dig in and when you look at what was going on at the time in the culture of the day, it was widespread civil unrest. I think we have this sing-song idea sometimes of the, the life or the ministry of Jesus, the life of the disciples, the apostles, and think that it you know, was kind of like our children's Bible books where there are you know, a bunch of guys walking around in white robes and sandals. It was complicated. It was a complicated situation, and uh, look, I I can't get into all the background it would take forever, but the nation of Israel had been taken over by the Romans, okay? They made the mistake of inviting the Romans in to help them with some of their problems in the first part. Romans got in there and said, well, we're staying. And uh, the people of Israel ended up having to pay very heavy taxes, They were oppressed. Their sense of national pride and dignity had been stripped away. They were hurting. It was only because of a great deal of unrest and social activity and agitation that they were granted immunity from some of the requirements to pay religious homage to the emperor. You know, they had to protest to keep the Roman pagan standards with the idols on them out of the temple and they did stuff like that they did stuff like that and some of their protests like that bore fruits of religious and civil liberty and they gained from it all right they were oppressed people they were harassed they were often brutally beaten by roman soldiers i don't know if you've thought about it but in the in the sermon on the mount when Jesus is talking about, you know, if someone asks you to carry their baggage a mile, go two miles. Well, a Roman soldier had the right to walk up to any citizen in, the, in Judea and say, uh, carry my bag. And they had to do it. That's the kind of stuff that was going on. The Roman soldiers occupied and policed the land. And there were protests. And some of them turned violent. Actually, quite a number of them turned violent. There were massacres, there were were all kinds of religious beliefs and ideas that were meshed together with differing agendas, religious, political, cultural. There was a lot of stuff going on, folks. There were racial tensions, there were cultural tensions, economic tensions, a lot of them, nationalistic tensions, in fact, The situation in that part of the world was so bad that within a few decades, the Romans were going to send in an entire army and completely destroy the entire city of Jerusalem. And they took it apart brick by brick and left nothing but a pile of rubble because it was so difficult. It was not a happy place. It was a very difficult place. And in the midst of this, in the midst of all this civil unrest and turmoil, walked Jesus Christ. He walked through this. And by doing the will of the Father, and by walking in the Spirit of God, in the power of God, he cut a straight path through a very difficult situation. Preaching repentance and the coming rule of God on earth, a.k.a. the kingdom of God. That's how he kept it straight, and that's how he kept it true. Go to Luke 13. Luke 13, verses 1 through 8. Out of our text for the day. (laughs) I don't have a lot of scriptures today, but I, I have some good ones, I think. Okay, so Luke 13, verses 1 through 8. Now... There were present at that time 
some who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them and said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you, you repent, you too will all perish. Or how about those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And then he told him a parable. I think I'm going to save the parable. We'll read it later. Okay, what was going on here? Scripture is very compact. And it really just hits the highlights. And you have to fill in. You have to think, well, what, what, what was this all about? What was going on here? Well, a group of people had gathered around and they were questioning Jesus about current events. That's what they were doing. They were saying, okay, this stuff's going on. Here's what happened. They were quizzing him about it, right? And based on the answer that he gave, what they were looking for was for him to kind of tell them which side he considered right. Which side he considered wrong? Who were right in this and who were wrong? Jesus, tell us. Declare yourself. Let me know. They wanted him to give his opinion. Whose cause was righteous? And whose was not? And I think the assumption was, if a person is aligned with the more righteous cause, then they themselves are more righteous. Hey, look, you know what? Some causes are righteous. You know it, I know it. Some causes are unrighteous. You know that, and I know that. Right? We all know that. So I'm not trying to pass judgment on any causes here. This message, what I want to say, is as much about me as it is about you or anyone else in the congregation. And over the years, you know, we've been together. We've gone through this stuff before, and we're going through it again. Okay. Okay. If a person is aligned with the more righteous cause, does that make them more righteous? Jesus said, okay, what do you think? Do you suppose that the people in this group over here are more righteous in the eyes of God than the people over here? Is that what you think? And then he followed up and basically he told him, I'm paraphrasing him a little bit, he said, the only path to righteousness is to repent before God. And what does God want from us? What does he want from you? What does he want from me? To practice justice. To love kindness. Mercy, depends on which translation you want to read. They mean the same thing. And to walk humbly with your God. It doesn't just say love justice, it says do it. Okay? Tall order. <laughs> it's a good one, too. Let me talk about Galilean blood. The blood of the Galileans. What's that all about? Okay. There isn't a historic account of this particular massacre, okay, of Jewish people, which, you know, it must have occurred sometime between the years of 27 AD and 31 AD when Jesus was active in ministry. However, presumably, the Galileans that are being discussed here were killed in the temple area. That seems very likely from the details that we have, where their blood would flow and it would run down into the little gutters they had built into the floor in the temple and it would merge with the blood of the sacrificed animals. Pretty grisly and gory scenario. So there's a religious setting to the whole thing. There are religious beliefs and religious agitation involved in this scenario. And uh, that's pretty plain to see, I think. However, it's, it's, 
it's too simplistic, and in fact, you know, a little bit silly to think that Pilate's men just swooped down suddenly and killed a crowd of innocent Jews who were quietly observing the rituals of the temple. That, that's a little naive. Now, we can gain insight into what was going on or what was really happening based on records we have of other similar events that happened around the same time, which were recorded okay, during Pilate's rule. And in particular, I'm referring to the writings of first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. You've probably heard of him before. From these, we know there were multiple Jewish religious groups who considered Roman occupation an affront to God. And for them, the only righteous position was to resist and to undermine and to seek to overthrow the Romans. Furthermore, it's known that such groups seem to have used gatherings at the temple, God's temple in Jerusalem, to incite people to take action. And some of these demonstrations in the temple turned violent, horribly violent. Now to deal with it, the Romans, they built this large barracks, a big barracks for the soldiers, which were basically the police force, okay? The, the troops, the Roman troops. And it's called the Fortress Antonia. And it's built right, it's like it's incorporated into the walls of the temple precinct. All right? They built it right there. And if you look at reconstructions based on archaeology, you'll see there's this big fort there built onto the side of the temple. That's for the Roman soldiers. And they, they put it there so that they could quickly mobilize large numbers of men to run down there and put down riots and rebellions and unrest that took place in the temple precinct. Josephus tells us of an instance where 2,000 dead bodies were left strewn all over the temple floor, their blood flowing all over the place in one of these incidents. There's another he records. I'm not, you know, I'm not quoting his you know, paragraph and sentence. There's another time where he tells us about an incident where 20,000 people died And he tells us, there's another one that's interesting, he tells us about a time when Pilate had his men, the soldiers, disguise themselves, you know, kind of going in as plain clothes officers, and they went down among the people who were demonstrating, and then they pulled out their short swords and they started killing people. Now I'm giving you all these details just to try and help you think about the scenario that Jesus was in, and the disciples. It could be very nasty. Very nasty indeed. Now the incident with the Galileans who were killed by Pilate's soldiers was probably something of this sort. And it was tragic. And people died. And the crowd wanted to hear what Jesus had to say about it. What have you got to say about all this stuff, Jesus? Was it... Uh, was it better to respect the Roman authorities and cooperate them, cooperate with them, like the Herodians, which we heard about, or the Sadducees? Is that what we should be doing, Jesus? Was it better or more noble to resist, like the Galileans and the Zealots? Is that what you, is that what you think, Jesus? Now, what about the Romans? Romans themselves. They're awful, aren't they? Aren't they the real villains? If we could just get rid of those Romans, everything would be great. It'd be peace, love, and understanding among all the Jews. What do you think, Jesus? Now, Jesus' answer, we read it already. Jesus' answer was basically what we heard in the first message. He said, None of these people are more righteous than the other people. That is not the perspective to have. <laughs> he said, all people are equal before God. In this case, equal because they were all equally 
guilty. All equally guilty. And all need to repent before God. And the only meaningful course of action, the long picture that we heard about in the first message, is to repent or you too will die in your sins. That's the only perspective to really have that's going to help you. Now you have the benefit of understanding God's truth in a way that a lot of people don't, which again was brought out in the first message. Let me ask you this. Who knows or really cares about the plight of the people in Galilee from 30 AD to 65 AD? Has anyone ever thought about it before? Has it ever been meaningful to you? No, look, you know a bit about it now, right? (laughs) You know about it because I just told you about it. Otherwise... Eh. water under the bridge, right? What would you care? That all happened a long time ago, right? Now hopefully, hopefully some of the people in the crowd who gathered around Jesus and wanted him to talk about what was going on right there heard Jesus preaching about the kingdom of God and heard what he had to say about believe, repent. Go for it. Get into the gospel message. Be baptized. I mean, I'm adding a little bit to what he, you know, the details of what he said here, but this is the message. So hopefully some of those people believed his preaching on the kingdom of God, repented, were baptized, took up their cross, and walked with God. I imagine some of them did. Otherwise, what's going to happen to all those people? And this is where your knowledge and understanding comes in. What's going to happen to all those people? They're going to wake up in the resurrection, the second resurrection, and they're going to look around them, and all their grievances will be meaningless. The God who sits on the great white throne will not be interested in passing judgment on the justice or injustice of Roman taxation policy. or the legitimacy of the occupation of Judea? Or should the United States have dropped the atomic bomb on the civilians of Hiroshima or not? The God whose eyes burn like the fire of the sun, the God of mercy, the God of judgment, The God who holds the precious gift of eternal life in his hand. I think it will look at people and say, okay, what I want to talk about is you. I want to talk about you. (laughs) All that other stuff's going to go away and fade away. I want to talk about you. Now, you know, we're talking about the great white throne judgment, but judgment is now upon the household of God, is it not? So these things all apply to us as well. And it's, it's never right for us to say, oh, that's them. <laughs> no, all these things apply to us. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about the Tower of Siloam. Okay, the Tower of Siloam. Jesus hears what they're saying, you know, and they ask him about the blood of the Galileans, and he says, oh, you know, that, that, that. And then what about the Tower of Siloam? He actually brings this in. He brings other current events into the, into the discussion. Okay? He says, well, what about these people who died at the Tower of Siloam? Now, a surface reading of the text, which is what we did, well, leads many people to conclude that this, this Tower of Siloam incident is just some sort of random calamity where a large public building just fell down one day and killed a bunch of people who were unfortunate enough to be passing by. So Jesus says this in his message is, okay, so therefore repent now because you never know what's going to happen. Lightning could strike you tomorrow. A meteor could fall on your head. You could get in a car accident on the way home from Sabbath services. So repent now. Well, you still have a chance, and that's kind of the way a lot of people interpret this. Now, 
there is nothing wrong with that interpretation because it's true. <laughs> it's true. Some random accident could indeed take you out this afternoon or next week or whatever. But it doesn't really seem to fit the context or have much to do with the question about the Galileans, for example, the blood of the Galileans spread all over the floor. And then who is righteous and who is not? Such an interpretation, I think, kind of makes Jesus appear as if he's changing the subject. You know, well, let's talk about the Tower of Siloam. Let me get out of this one. Whew. I don't think that's what he's doing. I'm going to give you a little bit of my, my take on things, my interpretation of scripture. I'm of the opinion that Jesus mentioned the incident at the Tower of Siloam because it was related to the political, the religious, and cultural uproar taking place at the time. That's why he brought it into the conversation. The tower was a large public building, public structure next to the small city reservoir there in Jerusalem called the Pool of Siloam, which is mentioned elsewhere in John 9. This reservoir was actually right next to the temple. And it made a lot of sense because the temple, well, they had all these sacrifices they were doing. There was a lot of blood, other animal bits and stuff like that, and they needed all this water to wash it away. It was, so it was there. It was for a practical reason. The Tower of Siloam, the, or sorry, the Pool of Siloam was right next to the temple, which needed a constant supply of water to wash away all this blood. The Tower of Siloam was also a controversial place. It was a controversial place. It was a public structure that had a lot of controversy around it because it was part of, a, it was part of an aqueduct system, and which is basically like their water supply. And they had to build these long, giant structures, and you still see them there, where water would be brought in based on these huge concrete stone structures that brought it in and... So it was a big system all over the nation that Pilate was constructing because uh, he wanted to improve the water supply in the city. The people were up in arms about it because Pilate was taking money from the temple treasury, the temple there in Jerusalem, to help pay for the project. So the people were, they were mad. I'm pretty sure that the Roman perspective was a little different. I, mean, I think I, I feel very confident in making that, that assessment. The Roman perspective was, hey, why not do something with all that money that's just sitting there that will benefit everybody in a very practical way, like improving the water supply, like bringing in a fresh supply of clean water? Is that not an obvious public good? That's how the Romans thought. That's how, they, that's how they thought about things. I mean, the Romans, they saw their rule <laughs> as a blessing to other, other people, other nations. A blessing of peace and prosperity. Because they would come in, they would police the whole situation, they'd put down you know, the various uh, parties and people agitating for their rights and all the little petty kingdoms that were fighting against each other. They stopped the constant warfare. Uh, they built road systems, they stimulated international commerce, they allowed all kinds of people to get rich and wealthy. And we hear arguments like that, you know, this is good, you should all be pleased about this stuff. We're benefiting all kinds of people. Look at the job rate, it's up. And people who resist us, people who resist Rome, well, they're just resisting for the sake of their own little petty causes. And they simply don't see the big picture. And they need to be forcibly put down. That's kind of the way the Romans looked at things. Within its own little orb, it logical, rational. I mean, to them, I, I don't, I mean, I don't think, most people think their cause is righteous. Don't they? Do people really attach themselves to a cause that they in their mind think is unrighteous? They may be deluded, they may be wrong, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I, I don't know if I can say this enough. There are righteous causes in this world, and there are unrighteous causes in this world too.
Now, the people of Judea saw it very differently than the Romans saw it, okay? The people were outraged, at least some of them, not all. They were outraged at this affront to the chosen nation of God. And there were lots of public protests. That's what was going on. And some of these protests may have taken place near the Tower of Siloam. The tower was right next to the temple, temple grounds, which was the most common gathering point for political and social agitation of that, of that day. Now, it could be, could be that the Tower of Siloam just fell down one day, just, you know, fell down of its own accord and crushed 18 unsuspecting people below. And if so, then Jesus was just citing two somewhat unconnected events where people died violently and suddenly urging his listeners to repent now before it's too late. I'm of the opinion that the massacres at the temple, the blood of the Galileans, and the deaths near the tower were connected because I think they were both involved in this turmoil in the nation. Public demonstrations against the policies of the Roman overlords who were wicked and did bad things. But on the other hand, they had their perspective. And the tower became an issue. And it's perhaps during demonstrations of this manner that some people might have it pushed part of the upper portions of the tower over and crushed people who were below. Perhaps they were symbolically trying to tear it down. And large stone towers don't usually fall unless something causes them to fall, like an earthquake or a fire which burns out the supporting wooden beams and stuff like that. But if it were an earthquake or just an accidental fire, where's the connection to the massacre of the Galileans? The connection between the two events was the question, I think. And the answer, were the victims righteous or were they guilty? Were they on the right side of history or not? And does aligning yourself with the right side in a fight or the right side of history affect your standing with God? Does it? And I appeal to you, brethren, for all different agendas and, and, and ways of looking at things. And there are many in this congregation. Believe me. For all those things, the answer is everyone needs to look deep within themselves and repent. That's the answer. That's what Jesus said. Maybe he was saying, you know, take, take your concern about what's going on here with the Galilean blood, Tower of Siloam, and use it as an opportunity to look at yourself and think about what's going on in the world. Think about what's going on inside yourself and repent. Now, I said the parable of the fig tree came right after, right? So let's read the parable of the fig tree, okay? Uh, that's, we'll pick that up in verse 6. Then he told them this parable. So he, you know, he's, he's kind of been talking about current events, and then he starts talking about fig trees. All right, I think there was probably a lot more you know, in between, but this is how the, Jesus is, I think he would be very challenging to talk to because you know, you, you'd, you'd ask him a question, this is based on what I see in the Gospels, and you'd be expecting a certain kind of an answer, you know, up or down answer. And he would come at it from a completely different perspective. <laughs> um, he told them this parable. And he said, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it 
And, um, you know, he might have gone to Lowe's and got some of those little fertilizer spikes you put in the ground. And he might have gone out and sung to the tree. You know, I hear that singing to plants is good for them, right? I'm going to take care of this tree. Just wait. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me deal with the tree, okay? And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Okay, this parable. On one level, on one level, parables always work on more than one level. On one level, the parable is about Israel. The Jews. The true king, the Messiah, was there among them. Were they going to listen to him? Would they hear him? And would they do anything about it? And if not, they would be uprooted and replaced. So the parable operates on that level. And we all know how the story goes. I hope you do. They were uprooted. They've been replaced by you. Now on another level, the parable is about us. Me. Me. This is a message as much for me as anybody in the congregation. The parable is about us. God is displeased when there is no fruit on the tree. He does not like his time and resources wasted. You know, (laughs) why should this tree that doesn't bear any figs be taking up this precious soil? Dig it up and put a new one in there. That's scary. That's scary. But there's an intercessor, right? The, the man who tends the tree said, whoa, hey, let me, he intercedes for the tree. He says, just let me work with the tree. Okay? The intercessor comes and he speaks his piece. We just read it. And God who is patient. We've heard about that in the first message. God is patient and he's willing to listen to the intercessor and to give the tree more time. But there will come a time when the waiting is over. And that poor little tree gets cut down. Now what is the fruit on the tree? Well, that's a whole message, isn't it? I'm not going to go into that. But let me try and summarize it in a quick way. The fruit on the tree are the attitudes and the ensuing actions, the doing, that reflect the mind of Christ. Go to John 13. John 13, verse 34. I hope you've heard this scripture before. A new command I give you. This is Jesus' words. It's red letters if you've got a red letter Bible. It says, a new command. I'm telling you something. New command. I want you to focus on this. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. In that same way, take my example, do this, and by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. It's actually not a new command. It's really the same command as John goes through in 1 John. It's a command that flows back to Deuteronomy, Leviticus, the Pentateuch. It's always God's message, always has been and always will be. It's a new emphasis, if you will. Love one another as I have loved you. Wow. Well, we've talked about what is love, what do we do, and you know, we'll keep talking about it. Because that's, that's our mission. That's our purpose. We are to proclaim the gospel of the coming kingdom of God. But also to prepare people to talk about what does God want. Let me talk to you a little bit about the disciples. Because he said this to the disciples, right? He said, I want you to love one another. So I want to talk about two of the disciples. Matthew and Simon. Disciples of Christ. One of the disciples was a man named Matthew. And Matthew had been a Jew who collaborated with the Roman overlords. He was a betrayer of his people, in a lot of people's eyes. That Matthew, 
He's a tax collector. He's working with the Romans. He made his living by extracting money from the poor and the working class and the struggling business entrepreneurs of Judea to help finance the rule of men like Pilate. That's what Matthew did for a living. And collaborators like Matthew, they just added to the burden and the oppression of their own people and turned a profit doing it. Now, another one of the disciples was a man named Simon. Now, he's one of the lesser known disciples. I'm not talking about Peter here. This Simon is distinguished from the other disciple, who's also known as Simon, Simon Peter, by his nickname. This guy had the nickname Simon the Zealot. You've heard of him? You heard of Simon the Zealot? I hope so. Man, you guys don't like to raise your hands. Well, some do. Thank you. <laughs> Simon the Zealot. He was another one of the disciples. So he had this nickname, the Zealot. Okay, in popular usage at the time, the term zealot was used for people who were extremely zealous for the Torah and the temple and strong religious nationalism, even to the point of public resistance to Roman rule. Violent and nonviolent. Now, this, this, is, this does not mean that Simon the Zealot was a reformed urban terrorist. But it does indicate that he was no sympathizer with the Romans or the Jewish authorities and collaborators who worked together with Rome. That would not be his perspective, would it? He would he would probably have some pretty strong opinions about stuff. I imagine that there were some very interesting conversations among Matthew and Simon the Zealot and Jesus, because Jesus was there. Just think about it. I imagine they had some very interesting conversations as they worked their way through overcoming the men they once were. Because it doesn't all go away in a flash, does it, folks? We carry a lot of baggage with us, and we have to work our way through it. I, I mean, I don't want to speculate on that too much, but I imagine there were some very interesting conversations. I mean, we know from we know other things that they didn't always agree. They argued among themselves, right? So these two men were both called by Jesus to be disciples. And some people... Some people have this view of Jesus that he was a zealot, you know, and oh, well, the fact that he had a zealot among his disciples means he was actually a social um, agitator. He was out there, you know, <clears throat> and some people interpret Jesus differently and they say, oh, no, no, he's just another one of these guys who's feeding you the opiate of the masses to keep you s submitted to the authorities. There's two, if, two ways, you know, of looking at everything. Those are two very common ways that people look at Jesus. I always figure if you've got everybody agitated at you, you must be doing something right. <laughs> That's how Jesus seemed to work it out. So these two men, Matthew and Simon, if you put them in the context of worldly struggles for power, freedom, nationalism, personal gain, these two men, Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot, were natural-born enemies. But within the context of God's calling to repentance and preparation for eternal life and the coming kingdom of God, these men were called to love one another. What is love? Big subject. I, I've given sermons on it before. 
What is love? Where do you go when you, wanna, when you really want to nail down the biblical definition of love? Anyone? Where do you go? Where? Yeah. Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. You may as well go there because that's where we're headed. So we're going to read the love chapter. But before I jump into the love chapter, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something about the book of Corinthians and what Paul's talking about here. I want you to notice that the previous section, I don't know, do you have little headings in your Bible? You know, I have these. They're not God-inspired, but they sometimes give you a good summary of what's to follow. If you look at it, the previous chapter, chapter 12, the second half of it in particular, what is it? It is a discussion uh, of unity and diversity within the body of the church. That's, that's the preamble to the love chapter. That's what Paul sets it up with. I mean, he tees it up with a message about unity and diversity within the body and the church. Read it. That's what it's talking about. That's the section where, you know, it talks about arms and legs and ears and eyes all having to function together. So let's read verses 1 through 3. Paul starts it off, the love chapter, and he says, I'm going to talk to you about an even better way. I'll show you a more excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. I'm a big old nothing burger. If I give all I possess to the poor, if I give over my body, to hardship or the flame, as it says in some translations. So that I can be proud of myself and for you know, what I've devoted myself to. But do not have love, I gain nothing. So all the zeal, all the knowledge... And even willingness to give up your life or give up all your possessions for a righteous cause gains nothing if you don't have love. And you'll, you know, <laughs> like the scenario of the white throne judgment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's talk about love. <laughs> when you, when, when, we all are before God, and we're before God in judgment now. That's what God wants to talk about. So let's read on. It says, uh, let's pick it up here in verse 4. It says, love. Okay, well, let's get, this is more boots on the ground, okay? This is good stuff. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, and it does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, and it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love doesn't fail. It doesn't go on and off, depending on the circumstances. Love doesn't fail. But where there are prophecies, okay, those will cease. Makes sense, right? <laughs> At one point, they'll all be fulfilled. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, this is getting us back to that kingdom of God perspective. That's the message of today, right? <laughs> but when that completeness comes, 
What is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put my ways of childhood behind me. If you're like me, you're still struggling with that. You know, you have to take stock of yourself on a regular basis. And sometimes trials, tribulations, troubles, they make you think about yourself. And it's good for you. It doesn't feel good, but it's good. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I only know in part. Then I shall know fully. Even as I am fully known. And now, these three things remain. Faith, good. Hope, good. And love. The greatest of these is love. Wow. <laughs> Go to Luke 9, verse 57. Going back to Jesus again. Lots of red letter reading today. The cost of following Jesus. Luke 9, verse 57 through 62. Okay, they were walking along the road. As they were walking along the road, Jesus and other people, a man said to him, I'm, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Uh, to me, that's Jesus' way of saying, you know, you're not going to fit in anywhere if you follow me. You won't have a quiet place to lay your head. It's the cost of following Jesus Christ. And he said to another man, so I guess it was a crowd, another man, follow me. Hey, you, follow me. This is the way to go. And the guy replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Let me take care of some obligations, family obligations. I need to do this. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead. Let them bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another guy said to him, another person said to him, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of God. What does that mean? Okay. Discipleship. Determination. Conviction. And the courage to follow through. On the calling. The high calling of your Lord Jesus Christ. Takes priority over community. Clan. Tribe. Family. Race. Class. Nationality, patriotism, ideology, every allegiance. So that means we've got to look inside. Because we've all got ties to something, don't we? Are the ties to that something greater? Are they more important? Do we deal with them first and then have some time for Jesus afterwards? The society that you see around you, all around you, and, and you know, people have, their, people have a different view on the society around them. Some people like it, some people hate it, some people are ambivalent, some people love their country, some people hate their country. The society, all of it, every little bit of it, is a dead man walking. Dead man walking. No matter what you think about it. And God says, let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury their own dead. Instead, follow me. Follow me. Seek 
first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, its righteousness, and you're going to get a much better return on your investment. 